question to be asked so often that we must ask the question. But today I'm going to do something a little different. I have my baby boy with me today, my son Elijah Red Wing. Uh, Elijah, you want to say hello? Say hello. Hi. Say hello to the listening audience. You want to say hi to Mama? Hi, okay. Mom. Okay, he's pretty quiet today. Well, listen, I just want to know if um, everybody been doing okay this week. Um, so much has been going on, and uh, we want the best for our people, for our community, for our villages. So I pray that all things have been well with everyone. We've certainly lost some other friends and people we know, uh, but we'll keep moving forward. Today I want to share a story, and I want you, if you don't mind, to pay close attention and think about it for a moment. And if you feel like I uh, feel up to it, you may call in. Uh, I'm going to try to get through this as fast as I can. We only have 30 minutes. So the number is 901-888-8555. Uh, is that correct? 901-888-6808. Uh, Let me start now with a story. If you have your Bibles with you, you be able to go to um, go to Hebrews chapter 13 verses 1 through 3. In there you will find something that goes like this. It's interesting to note that brotherly love according to the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews includes hospitality to strangers. Some have turned out to be angels and remembrance of those in prisons as though you are cellmates and remembrance of the ill-treated in solidarity with them, realizing that the same fate can be yours at any time. This is an excellent peg on which to hang this essay, since brotherly love is a major casualty of living in hell, American style. Living in hell, American style. An old man and some workers he had hired were seen one day staggering through the streets of Rome, dragging by harness a huge slab of rock. Some of the onlookers laughed at the odd sight, and one of the onlookers, out of curiosity, shouted, Hey, old man, what are you doing dragging that giant, ugly stone? What can be possibly, what can you possibly do with something like that? The procession stopped for a moment for the men to rest, and the old man, in response to the onlooker, said, There's an angel in that stone. Thus the legend had it, has it was the beginning of Michelangelo's masterpiece of sculpture, an angel liberated from a massive, ugly stone, the beautiful statue of David. Now, listening audience, here's the, the start. And here's a parable from present-day ghetto reality. Like most of us, Mrs. Williams found it difficult to love all of God's children the same. Grover Jr. Johnson, because his father name was Junior Johnson, his mother named him Grover to prevent her son from becoming Junior Johnson Jr. Grover was a boy that Mrs. Williams found particularly hard to like and much less love, and to her point of view for good reason. He was kind of an ugly youngster and didn't seem interested in school. His eyes had that expressionless, unfocused appearance. His super curly hair was never combed, and his clothes smelled musty. And the other children called him grubby. And whenever he answered Mrs. Williams' questions in class, it was always in mumbled sounds that were difficult to comprehend. Since there was so little to really like about Grubby Grover Jr. Johnson, whenever Mrs. Williams marked his paper, she experienced a strange pleasure from putting X's next to his wrong answers and big red F's at the top of his papers. Perhaps Mrs. Williams should have known better. She had access to Grover's record, and she certainly knew more about the boy than she was ready to admit. The records in some restated first grade. Grover shows promise in his work and attitude, but his situation at home is poor. Second grade, Grover could do much better. 
his mother seriously ill, and he receives little help from home. And third grade, Grover is a good boy, but he's a very slow learner, and his mother died this year. And fourth grade, Grover behaves well enough, but he is very slow, and his father's on drugs and alcohol, and he shows absolutely no interest. This parable is the story of two African Americans dancing the morbid dance of hell that is characteristic of part that American style. Mrs. Williams' ego and pride is more the creation of the majority community than her own, have made her an unwitting agent of white America. Her assignment is to make certain that white America's prophecy concerning Grover comes true. And she views Grubby Grover Jr. Johnson as a menace, biological, economic, social, and cultural. Grover is a child whose potential humanity is obscured by a virtually impenetrable accumulation of destructive neg negative life responses and reactions. His precious life had been deposited with too little encouragement and love, poverty and neglect, and no fear of God. And without instant specific remedial intervention from someone who cares, he will be sentenced on a life term of margin of existence, a little help to himself and a burden to society. Stated bluntly, Mrs. Williams, a middle-class African-American teacher, and Grubby Grover Jr. Johnson, a product of African-American ghetto underclass, are resident victims of a horn, victims of a hell fashioned for them by white America. Both of them are hooked on the horns of a dilemma they neither sense nor comprehend, and neither of them has the foggiest idea why the other is the enemy. And just for a moment there, I think about Grover Jr. Johnson. I think about that beautiful teacher that stands there. And I'm so reminded of so many young men, especially my own situation growing up in North Memphis and at Pope Elementary, where a lot of us, a lot of boys came out of Hurt Village and many of us experienced some of the same painful and ugly situations in our life. And we seem to handle those situations quite a bit differently. Some of us were withdrawn and would sit in the back of classes. Some of us were class clowns and we cut up just so other people would laugh with us instead of laughing at us. We tried our best to hide the pain and the suffering, the abuses, the physical abuse, the sexual abuse, and all the other traumas in our lives. I remember even then having friends at Pope Elementary who had lost mothers and fathers and others in their family that hurt them so deeply. And remember, most of our kids didn't get no therapy or counseling during that time, so we had to learn to deal with those situations to the best of our ability. And many of us found ourselves cutting up in school, and many of us found ourselves crying, and nobody knew and understood why. Many of us would run away from home because we were hurting so much, and we were hide from the pain Many of us, just like they said in the story, some of us smelled mustard because we didn't have the adequate uh, health issue things that we needed at home. I remember there were times when our lights were turned off where we ended up having to, or at least I did, went by service stations in the neighborhood and take wash-ups just so people wouldn't laugh at me. My tennis shoes were always soiled, and I always had issues. And I was always ashamed and always tried to hide my hurt and my pain. And I would do things like take money from my mother's purse to go and buy candy at the stores just to give to other children in the school so that they would be my friend and they would love me, they would care for me, they wouldn't laugh at me and make fun of me. I tried to join the guys who were tough, but I was too afraid to get involved in those things. I wanted a way to deal with my hurt, my pain, and my, my difficulties in life, and I just didn't know how to do it. See, most of my friends and family members didn't know that when I was a little boy at that age, I had been raped. Nobody knew and understood that I had been in and out of little institutions, and I was running away from home, and I was frightened that I would lock myself up in my room at home and listen to music and start smoking weed at a very young age to try to deal with my hurt, my pain, and my suffering. I cried. I had all sorts of identity problems. You know, I was hurting so much. 
And my poor mother wasn't there as much as she wanted to be because there were seven or eight other children at home. And we all had our pent-up issues. We all had our uh, abandonment issues. We had all of had our abuse issues. We had our uh, physical abuse issues. Some of us had our sexual abuse issues. We had all kinds of problems. And we didn't know how to deal with it or address those issues. Now look at Grover Jr. Johnson. Sounds like a wonderful young man, but he has some issues. His slow is learned. He is a, he's a slow learner, and he, he's having a difficult time in keeping up in the class. And then other children laugh at him and play and make fun of him because they don't understand the purpose and the situation by which he's trying to cover it up. But the truth is, many of those, some of those same children in those classrooms had the same kind of issues. Yet we found ourselves laughing and making fun of other people just to cover up our own pain. And I tell you, when I tell you as a child, as we grow into that man, it hurts so much. It's a deep pain. And we cry. Sometimes we don't know why we cry. We're unhappy. We have to walk home by ourselves and we lock ourselves away in rooms and do whatever we can to, to run from the painful situations. And then we become embarrassed to read in front of groups and crowds. Because the truth is, we had difficult times reading. There were other kids who could do well, but we couldn't, so people laughed at us. And the truth is, we did everything in our power to cover it up so nobody would laugh. We always thought people knew our secrets. So we did things to try to make sure people didn't know our secrets. So we did all sorts of off-the-wall things. And then, of course, there were teachers in the school who really did care. There were those who looked up at us. But I'm reminded of Miss, Miss Williams. Miss William was a tall, beautiful black woman, dressed beautiful with earrings and smelled good and looked good, always. But the truth is, many of the Mrs. Williams who were in our school came out of some of the same backgrounds that we did. We just never understood it then. And many of them were ashamed or looked at us as a, as a minister society. We, they looked at us like they would say, yuck, because they were ashamed and didn't want to go back to their own painful situations, so many of them didn't know how to even handle those situations. They did the best they could. I had some who really did the best they could to help us. Of course, I ended up in institutions. I ended up on crack. I ended up homeless and a lot of other situations, and so many of the young people that I knew growing up did the same thing, and many of them died very young. They lost family members. The situation just went downhill for many of them, but there were some who had some successful stories. And I'm sure by now y'all remember Mrs. Williams and Grubby Grover Jr. Johnson, two people who are living in a hell that is not of their design, that is not of their consciousness. Well, some of those teachers, as I said, really tried hard. And some of them did well. And some of those kids refused to give up, and they tried so very hard to do better. And I just happened to be one of those kids. I never wanted to give up. Even though my situation was so tragic and so painful, I just didn't want to give up, though. No? I didn't want to live that way anymore, and I didn't want to die in that way anymore. I needed to learn what happened to me, what's going on with me. Why am I in and out of institutions? Why are people looking down at me? Why am I always afraid? Why am I so hurt? Why am I have so much fear and have all the identity problems? I had to find out and not use crack anymore and alcohol anymore and sex and everything else. I wanted to find a way out because I didn't want to end up that way. And I needed somebody to come along and hear my stories and listen to me. And I had wonderful people, friends like Willie Henry and Miss Elsa Branch and uh, Miss Leslie Lee and Dixie Fletcher. So many others came along and they were the angels put in spots when I needed them to help me get from one place to the other. But strangely enough, no matter what happened, no matter, no matter how many institutions I went into, I had to go back into that same community, back into that same house, that same situation that was not effectively dealt with in the way that it should have been. Well, <coughs> like Grover Jr. Johnson, the good Lord gave both Grover Jr. Johnson and Mrs. Williams a special opportunity, as he did for me. They took the advantage of the gift. Each of them turned inward and achieved personal renewal in a new and creative 
powerful, significant other, and they establish a brother-sister relationship for now and eternity. Now let me share you a parable from present-day ghetto reality part two. Christmas came that year, and the boys and girls from Mrs. Williams' fifth grade class brought her Christmas presents. They piled their presents high on her desk and crowded around to watch her open them. To much, widget, to much of Mrs. Williams' surprise, there was one from Grubby Grover Jr. Johnson. Y'all, it was characteristically ugly, wrapped in brown paper, held together with plastic tape with a message on it that read simply, For Mrs. Williams from Grover. When she opened up Grover's gift, I felt a gritty old ugly rhinestone bracelet and a pile of cheap perfume. The other boys and girls began to giggle over Grover's gift, but Mrs. Williams had at least enough grace and silence to silence them immediately. Putting the bracelet on and some of the perfume on her wrist and holding her wrist up for the others, she said, Ah, oh, doesn't it smell lovely? And the other children, taking a cue from their teacher, readily agreed with oohs and ahs. But at the end of the day, when school was over, and the other children were gone. Grover Jr. Johnson lingered behind. Slowly, he came over to the desk and said softly, Mrs. Williams, Mrs. Williams, you smell just like my mother, and her bracelet looks pretty on you, too. I'm glad you like my presence. When Grover left, Mrs. Williams got down on her knees and asked God to forgive her. The next day, the children in room 111 were greeted by a new teacher. Something had happened to her, for Mrs. Williams had become a different person committed to loving all of God's children with a passion not known before, especially the slow ones, especially Grover Jr. Johnson. By the end of that year, Grover showed dramatic improvement, and he had caught up with many of the other students and was even ahead of some. The years went by, and Mrs. Williams lost touch with the fifth graders of that class until one day she found a note in her mailbox and it read simply, Dear Mrs. Williams, I wanted you to be the first to know that I will be graduating second in my class from high school. Love, Grover Jr. Johnson. Four years later, another note came, Dear Mrs. Williams, they just told me I will be graduating first in my class I wanted you to be the first to know because you did so much for me, and I'm so grateful. The university has not been easy, but I've loved every minute of it. And four years later again, dear Mrs. Williams, as of today, I am Grover Jr. Johnson, medical doctor. How about that? I wanted you to be the first to know because I'm getting married next month, the 27th to be exact. And I was wondering if you would come and sit where my mother would have sit if she were alive. You're the only family that I have now. Dad died last year. Hopefully with love, Grover Jr. Johnson. I'm told that Mrs. Williams went to that wedding and said what Grover's mother would have said. She earned the right to sit there. For beneath the stony glazed over surface of her life, even she found hard to like. And much less love, she heard the sound of muffled wings and helped to set an angel free. How about that? How many of you know that you have the power, the gifts, and the talents mm -hmm. to reach out to one of those uh, wonderful African children in our community and reach out and show them love and attention and help those who are beating down on them with, and help them out of the painful and tragic circumstances that they're experiencing. How many of you know that you can connect them to the African Village Institute and other places that will help them out of darkness into the marvelous God's marvelous light? We can do that, black people. If we are willing to reach out to our children, we know the pain and suffering our children because many of us have been there. All we must do, all we have to do, if we can't do it, just be willing to connect them to somebody else that's willing to do it. And then we don't have to worry about the young dogs being murdered. Even though he tried his best to come out of darkness into the marvelous light, and he did a great job. But ultimately, things caught up with him, and his young life was taken. 
We don't have to experience that anymore, y'all. We don't have to experience the murder, the shooting, the dropout, and all the other painful things that our children. All we have to do is be willing to connect them to the sources, the resources that they need to be able to get the therapy and the counseling and the love and the support that they need in order for them to become effective young men and women, that they can become productive people in our society. And we can stop this chain, this madness that's happened to us. We know what's happened to us. The kind of systemic racism and hatred and all the other painful things that's happened, it's a residue from it. We still experience a residue from it. And the only way we're going to come out of this darkness is we are going to have to stand up one day, not bend our back anymore, not let anybody ride our back. We've got to learn how to love ourselves first. We've got to trust and believe that love is the only force that can transform an enemy to a friend. And that enemy is with me. It starts with me. I'm my own enemy. And I've got to find a way out of that. And sisters and brothers, we can do that by helping each other, helping our children and those who are still lost. We still have a couple of minutes. 901-888-6805. If you want to share, if you want to talk, if you want to say anything, you still have a few minutes. I'm Norman Redwing with the African Village Institute, 1225 Ballantyne Avenue in North Memphis, in the heart of where our babies are, in the heart of where the pain and hurt and brokenness is, in the heart where the su suffering is. And we have what it takes to help you out of darkness into the marvelous light. You just have to be willing to stand up and don't bend over no more for anybody. Not even our own. If they're not willing to go with us, if they're not willing to help themselves, you got to shake the dust from your feet and move on. I remember the day I dropped out of high school, my best friend, uh, I called him one day. I said, man, I can't do this. I got to go back. I got to go back. And I begged him. I said, man, come on, go back with me. And that was, what, eight, nine years later, I begged him still, man, let's go back. Let's go back. He refused to go back. I made up my mind that I was not going to end up that way. And I went on and left him, left him behind. And many of those that I left behind, they never did finish. But I made it up my mind that I was not going to give up. And to this day, that's one of my major goals and one of the things that I have set in place that I refuse to give up on Norman Red Wing and I refuse to give up on my people. No matter how difficult it might seem or appear to be, we're going to move forward for those who are willing to help themselves. 901-888-6805. My cell number is 901-859-1689. We had a wonderful service today, and we watched um, um, on Prime, we watched a lecture called Contradiction, um, A Question of Faith, and boy, it was powerful. We had an open discussion, we had fellowship, we had salad, we had cake, we had dessert. We had a wonderful time. That's what we do. We don't do all the religious stuff. We have open spiritual uh, in invitations to our ancestors. We uh, have open discussions about what we are learning, and we reach out to each other, and we try to make it work, and we're working on a major conference coming up in May this year. So that's the kind of work we do. We work, man. We're working. We're trying to make it happen because we love our people. We love what God has allowed us to do, and that's to come out of darkness. I can't help but say that and constantly say that coming out of darkness into the marvelous light. God knows he's allowed me to do that. So I will always give the rest of my life committed to those who came in that I'm able to ride on their shoulders. There are those who are still alive, shoulders I'm able to ride on still. And my ancestors and those who, were, who died and suffered so much, and they did it in order to make life better for me and didn't even know me by name, but they were willing to do it for me. And the only way that I can ever repay them is to learn of them, change my life, get better, learn of them, and go out and unlearn, learn, and teach and help our people to do the same so we can move forward. I have my seven-year-old sitting here with me, Elijah Ray Redwing, and his, I have a, a, the, the number one behind his name. Uh, he, I plan to do the same with him as I've done with all my, my grown children. I'm going to teach them about their history, their culture. They're going to learn. 
They're going to work toward it. They're going to be in the village. They're going to do everything in their power to unlearn, learn to teach. Even the little things that they have to unlearn today, we're going to be there to do that. So if you want, please call me, 901-859-1689. That's Norman Red Wing, 901-859-1689. We're at the African Village Institute in North Memphis, across the street from Northside High School. And if there's anything that we can do to help our people out of that darkness, God has given us a pathway by which we can do it. But you have to take the step, and we will walk with you, knowing that our Creator and our ancestors are right along with us. I'm Norman Red Wing, and this is the African Village Institute of Memphis, Tennessee. Thank you once again. God bless you. Maybe doctor for a doctor. I'm a mom.